Hi everyone, thank you for joining our panel today on privacy in the MCU. Uh, we hope this is a really fun panel. We want it to be very engaging, very informative, also very um, audience participation and discussion based. Um, so if we ask any questions to the audience, just feel free to, to shout out your answers. Um, so to begin, um, I am Bailey Sanchez and this is Tatiana Rice. We both work at the Future of Privacy Forum, uh, which is a nonprofit based in DC. Um, and one of the core principles that we have is that we believe that technological innovation and um, strong privacy safeguards can coexist. Um, so we support both emerging technology and also um, baking in uh, privacy safeguards into that. And that, um, that belief really informs a lot of the work we do. Um, so I'm a policy counsel uh, on our youth and ed team and Tatiana is a policy counsel um, on our legislative team. Um, so to start out, Tatiana, do you want to share a bit about what you do and also what your favorite uh, Marvel character is? Oh man, okay. Um, I'll start off. My name's Tatiana Rice. Uh, I'm a lawyer and policy counsel at Future Privacy Forum. Like Bailey said, uh, I work on a lot of legislation work, uh, but I also lead our biometrics work streams. So things like facial recognition, uh, fingerprinting, things like that, looking at the ethical data practices there and how it, you know, is best to regulate those things. Um, I'm really excited to be here at Dragon Con specifically for this panel because it really merges my two like nerdy interests of like data privacy and Marvel. So uh, thank you all so much for being here. I'll flip it back to Bailey. You didn't say what your favorite character oh, right. is. <laughs> I was kind of trying to avoid that. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if it's fair. Uh, I mean, I like the old school Iron Man. I'm not going to lie. He's not my favorite one. <laughs> uh, my favorite Marvel character is Scarlet Witch because I support women's rights, but I also support women's wrongs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the purpose of this panel, we're going to be using the MCU to kind of help issue spot uh, privacy issues. We're going to talk about privacy harms, uh, what is privacy, why it's important, um, and then talking about like just different privacy risks and like perhaps like what you can do to mitigate those. So uh, I thought a good place to start to introduce the concept of what is privacy would be to talk about um, Spider-Man, because uh, generally in the MCU, we don't have secret identities for the most part. A lot of the characters are kind of out in the open. Um, one bit of, big exception to that is Spider-Man, and he has a secret identity that does end up being revealed at the end of Far From Home, and we kind of see the implications of what uh, that means for him in uh, the beginning of No Way Home. So, Tatiana, do you want to talk a little bit about, like, what is a privacy harm? Yeah, so, uh, like Billy said, a Spider-Man has a secret identity, and at the end of No Way Home, you see on that uh, giant screen in New York, you know, the Daily Beagle, right? Is that what it is? Beagle. Thank you all. Artist participation. <laughs> <laughs> um, he says, everybody, this is who Spider-Man is, Peter Parker, and his life kind of blows up. But it's problematic not only for Peter as he is working through college admissions, but also his family and friends. And you see how data privacy harms can go even beyond just the individual, because that individual, you can probably tell, is connected to all of these other individuals. Um, so I think that's a really interesting way to conceptualize why privacy is important, uh, not only to people, but people that are you know important to you as well, and trying to keep their lives in check and in control of themselves. Yeah, and we see that in No Way Home where uh, Peter's friends and family are actually put at risk um, because now his identity has been revealed. People know who Peter Parker is. People know that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Um, so when you're thinking about kind of what is a privacy harm, what are the privacy risks, I feel like uh, Spider-Man is a good way to conceptualize that because it's really like a privacy harm is a very amorphous concept. Um, I feel like a lot of people, when they think of like a privacy harm, they might think of like uh, like a data breach, but there can be um, like non-legal consequences. There can be reputational harms. There can be harms to your friends and family. Um, and also in Peter Parker's co uh, case, uh, once once your identity has been revealed, you can't really get that back. Um, so when you have a privacy harm that like happens perhaps on the internet, it's very hard to kind of rewind that and take that back. And then we see that at the end of No Way Home, where really the only way to kind of undo what has happened um, as with Peter's privacy harm is literally to kind of like reset everything. And that results in uh, none of his friends and family or no one knowing who he is. And 
uh, kind of starts at square one. But uh, we we hear in not the MCU do not have the the ability to reset things <laughs> and make everyone forget who we are. And also that wasn't like that was the best way that he could address that. But obviously it was not the ideal scenario. And I think he would have preferred a world where he could have continued to keep his identity a secret. Yeah, and this, um, if you can conceptualize it a little bit more, even in a, perhaps more problematic situations where maybe somebody is trying to avoid an abuser or a stalker or anything like that, it's really, really important to these people that their privacy uh, remain anonymous. And when that is taken out of their control of like who they want their information to be revealed to, obviously it can have really terrible consequences that can be violent. Um, you also had, you said a little bit about how at the end of No Way Home, um, obviously they use the erasure to delete people's memories of the, so in uh, privacy law, um, there's sometimes something called the right to be deleted. Um, so this was uh, in the EU's general data protection regulation. You can, you have the right to tell companies to delete certain information about you um, to a certain extent, like unless they still need it to like communicate with you about something. Um, but that's pretty important in terms of like making sure that companies aren't just collecting everything under the sun about you and then perhaps that gets out of your control because they sell it to another company and that company sells it to another company and things like that. Uh, you brought up regulation and I think maybe that's a good time to pivot into um, to discussing the Civil War and the Sokovia Accords. Um, and so I think we're going to use this to talk about like perhaps why privacy regulations are important and also perhaps why there might be some pitfalls uh, with privacy regulations because me and Tatiana don't uh, fall on the same side of the Civil War, <laughs> let's say. Uh, so what are the Sokovia Accords? I mean, we know what the Sokovia, I mean, most people, I'm sure, know what these Sokovia Accords are. I think this might be a little bit of a stretch of analogy, but it maybe is helpful. So everybody knows what FANG companies are. What's the other acronym that people are saying now? Yeah. What is it? Yeah. GAFM, all the big tech companies, right? So. Um, these companies, we can conceptualize them all, almost similar to the Avengers in my head. Uh, some other people could <laughs> definitely argue against that, and they probably should. Um, but they can, they have all this data. They're collecting all this data, and they can do really good things. They can help stop human trafficking. They can um, try to find terrorists. They can go through communications to help identify threats, which we'll talk about more later. Um, so they do have this ability to be really consequentially good in the world. Uh, however, left unchecked, like the Avengers, in my opinion, uh, is not a good thing um, and something that regulations are good for. So if you think about Civil War, they had the Sokovia Accords to make sure that the Avengers are being accountable to the, um, what is it, the World Council? Uh, it was not the World Council, it was the UN, because I think the, the World Council, yeah, that was right. in another movie and did yeah, yeah, not pan right. out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so in my opinion, yeah, that's a reason that those things are good because they need to be accountable to somebody. They can't just be accountable to themselves. And we've seen kind of time and time again, they're like, oh, we do these things. Um, but if nobody's holding you accountable to these things that you're saying, then, you know, how good is it actually? Don't know. But I know, so I will say I was team Iron Man in Civil War and as it relates to specifically to data privacy regulations, but Bailey, maybe you a different take. Yeah, well, so I did watch Age of Ultron just this morning, so it is very <laughs> tough to argue um, against the Sokovia Accords because I had forgotten quite how, like, catastrophic that was, but I'm going to I'm gonna stick with my points anyways. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think a problem with the Sokovia Accords is, uh, I don't remember which Avenger raised this idea, but they were like, how will you enforce this? What will it, uh, like, what is the enforcement mechanism? It's kind of like uh, someone brought up the idea, I think it was Captain America, that perhaps the Sokovia Accords were done as like, like a political stunt or something more performative because they were like, at this very catastrophic event, we need to do something in reaction to it. I believe um, they, all of the countries like agreed to the Sokovia Accords only like a hundred or so days after what happened in Sokovia. And in my mind, a hundred days is not not a long time to kind of like get um, agreement on something that has been signed on by uh, over a hundred countries. And so I think. Uh, while the intention of the Sokovia Accords was nice, like if you really like take a step back and take a step back from being very reactionary, um, if you think about it, like 
how, how are they going to enforce that? Like the superheroes, like as we saw, they kind of like went and did what they were going to do anyways. Um, and then not just like on the enforcement piece, but just the fact that the superheroes were not like consulted as part of the process. Like, yes, it was done to regulate the superheroes. Um, but I think when you have uh, regulation, it's important to consult with all interested stakeholders um, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to be impacted. Um, so perhaps if the superheroes had been uh, consulted from the beginning and kind of like worked with um, the UN to kind of come up with like, okay, we agree that there needs to be some action done because I don't think I'll, like I don't think any of them agreed that what happened in Sokovia was was a good thing, and they thought like okay, we need to do something about this. There was just disagreement in how that takes place, and I think we see that a lot in like tech uh, tech policy. Like I think there's broad agreement that things need to be done about certain like. For example, um, there's pretty broad agreement that we should do something about uh, protecting kids on the internet, but what that looks like in practice, uh, there's not a lot of consensus on. Um, and I think that if you consult parties, like every interested party, uh, it can help you have a, a, a better and stronger regulation and one that like also can be enforced because again, like if you do something with no enforcement like companies are just going to continue to do what they're going to do like how the avengers continue to do what they were going to do yeah so that's a very fpf position <laughs> that you know all stakeholders should be consulted and like probably personally i do believe that but i mean in this context there's a lot of pushback and i'll play devil's advocate here should companies like facebook and google be consulted when we're you know building data privacy laws when they're the ones causing the harms you know I mean, it's a it's a great question. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to answer that. <laughs> question to think about for the audience. <laughs> I feel like Congress doesn't know very much about technology. Yeah, and that's a very fair point and a very like great analogy for this as well because you know. Um, a lot of these countries, do they really understand like what the superheroes' powers are? Uh, probably not. Um, and yeah, I think Congress, uh, we have definitely seen in the past that not everyone fully understands, like perhaps like how Facebook's monetization structure works. And I think that's a very key component of making meaningful regulations. Because if you don't understand what it is you're regulating, uh, it might lead to some unintended consequences. Um, and there might be perhaps loopholes, in it, uh, which is not what people intend when they pass regulations. But privacy regs generally, I would say, are pretty reactionary, right? So like GDPR happened pretty quickly after Snowden. Um, we saw with the current post-Dobbs decision, so like the right to abortion being struck down by the Supreme Court, a ton of privacy regs and people were talking about that um, being introduced. Looks like, is there a question in that back? Um, so FPF doesn't typically focus on like law enforcement, um, data and regulation, but I, I do know that, uh, to, to speak to your point, that there have been a lot of laws passed in states to protect victims' privacy, um, and because of the way that they were crafted, um, that has been kind of like, some would say weaponized so that police can keep their actions private um, because of just the way the laws are written. And again, that's one of those laws that like uh, had really great intentions, but perhaps uh, they did not consult all the parties that were most uh, impacted by the law, or perhaps they didn't think about what those unintended consequences are. I think that's something we really emphasize a lot at FPF is trying to like play out what all the different scenarios are because you don't want to have a law that you don't want to have a law that's stale and you don't want to have a law that just isn't going to work in practice for the next 10 years. You want it to be um, have sufficient safeguards, but also be flexible enough to keep up with uh, technology, because I think we can all agree that technology is moving at a much faster pace than than what Congress moves at. Um, so you want to be thinking what like the long game is, essentially. But I will say, I mean, even with that, there is some reactionary things that are done specifically to police conduct and police actions. And the thing that comes up most to me is like right after or during the Black Lives Matter protests that were happening a lot during the summer of 2020, um, 
there was a lot of allegations and uh, evidence that police in New York were using facial recognition to be able to identify who was at protests. So there started to be legislation being introduced in New York as it relates to police's ability to do that and what limitations there should be. Um, but the thing that's good about government, good about government, they do have some level of regulation. <laughs> they have, you know, the Fourth Amendment, so there are safeguards against how they use that to some extent at least. Private companies, very much less so at least in the U.S. Yeah, 100%. I actually, I generally do agree. It's really important actually for these stakeholders to be at these meetings because they are the ones who need to implement them. And if they're implementing them poorly or they're unworkable, it's not going to solve anything. Um, so Depends on the law. <laughs> Yeah, I think we... Yeah, we actually have a panel later on the Algorithmic Accountability Act, which is another bill that was introduced in terms of um, how we should audit these companies or how their algorithms function. Um, so we can talk about it then. Ha happy to invite you there as well. Yeah. I think that's a really great point that you just raised because like when we're saying that companies should have a seat at a table, we don't just mean like talk to Mark Zuckerberg and see like how he feels about it. Like Facebook has um, a whole host of people that work there. They have uh, people in policy, people in legal, um, and again, software developers. I think it's certainly uh, important to consider software developers as um, a constituent when you are uh, creating regulations because you know, there might be something that like, like the policy itself sounds really great, but then you talk to a software developer and they're like, hey, this doesn't really make sense or we can't do this or like practically speaking, it's not going to give you the intended result. Um, and again, I think that just goes back to the point that like perhaps the Sokovia Accords would have been more successful if they had talked to all of the, the Avengers beforehand to kind of come up with what the best system would be. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Uh. You just brought up a really good point about the difference between private companies and the government. And is it feasible for privacy laws to speak to kind of both worlds, or do you kind of get lost in the, the differences there between terrorists and private companies' rights to track and whatnot? That seems like a challenging thing. Do we want to talk about Project Insight? Yeah, I think that's a really great pivot to talk about Project Insight. Um, so now we're going to talk about a couple different um, technologies within the MCU. I think the format that we're going to follow generally is kind of just like explain briefly what is the technology, because some of these movies came out uh, over a decade ago. Um, and then what are the benefits to that technology? There might be none. Um, and then what are the risks to the technology and kind of just how that played out in the MCU and how that might apply to the real world. So to talk about Project Insight, um, does anyone remember what Project Insight was from Winter Soldier? Yeah, I think after this panel, it would I recommend everyone go and watch Winter Soldier. Um, it came out, I think, in like 2014, so that was well before I had started my career in privacy, and I went back and watched it recently, and it was uh, it really hit home for me. It was very on the nose, uh, <laughs> talking about issues with surveillance. Um, so Project Insight was three helicarriers that were synced to a network of targeting satellites, um, and they were going to be continuous flights. So once 
once they hit go on Project Insight, it was going to be three helicarriers that just were circling the globe and never came down. Um, and so I took some quotes from the movie that I thought were really uh, impactful, also a little scary, a lot scary. Um, one of them was from Nick Fury. Satellites can read a terrorist's DNA before he steps outside of his spider hole. Um, and he said that as like a, a positive. Um, th the data that they used for Project Insight, like where it came from, it was collecting location information, tapping into city cameras, phones, tweets, um, SAT scores. Um, and so what it was is it was going to be like an algorithm that could predict who was a threat to society before they actually acted upon that threat. So it was kind of like a predictive policing model, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so the quote that really stuck with me was, we're going to neutralize a lot of threats before they happen. And then Captain America is like, I thought the punishment usually came after the crime. And that's really what sets off a lot of the discourse within the movie. Um, so I think it, I think it's fair to say that there were some good intentions from Nick Fury. I mean, we can debate about intentions. Like, obviously, it's great to not have crime in the world, but should you... Like, should you use someone's SAT data to make a predictive decision on them before they have even done anything wrong? Um, so that's the tech. Uh, are there any any benefits to that? <laughs> <laughs> Theoretically, I guess. But <laughs> I don't even know how to answer that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you it's pretty clear how this applies to present day. Um, you think about the way, I mean, even slowed in all of the revelations that they had there and what the NSA was able to collect about Americans. Um, and this just continues specifically on the kind of government level to compare government versus private. Um, then being able to collect all the data in the um, idea that the government actually follows its own laws. Um, there are regulations to be able to police what they can use, what they can collect. Um, there's a fair amount of statute there. The issue is when you run into the issue of um, them getting data from private companies that are collecting it, and there being far less restrictions about what companies can sell or share uh, to law enforcement, and then what they can do with that is kind of up to them. I had a point, and I just lost it. So if you want to keep <laughs> talking. Yeah. You would think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you would think, and that I don't, and I don't think we even necessarily think you should be more private and keep, like you should have a right to be able to have your SAT score somewhere on a website without it being used to predict whether or not you're going to be uh, a criminal. And I think, I think a really interesting uh, point from uh, Winter Soldier that maybe isn't a one-to-one -one mirror from what happens in. The real world is that like in Winter Soldier, you find out that this is all secretly orchestrated by Hydra. And so there's a clear bad actor that you can point to and you're like, OK, like Hydra is very clearly evil. Uh, they are the masterminds behind this. This was an evil tech. Um, but then you have like Nick Fury who like thought it was for a good use. But at the end of the day, do you think it matters if there's a bad actor and a good actor? Do you think if it was like if Hydra had not infiltrated shield it seems like they were going to continue with this plan and nick fury was in favor of it even though he was not a hydra agent so do you think the distinctions between like who is good and who is bad really matter when you have a very powerful technology yeah and i think that's something that's definitely worth considering yeah Yeah, I think that's a great point. I'll just repeat the point really quickly since it's being recorded. Uh, someone from the audience brought up that um, saying that like, okay, like if it falls into the right hands, then this is bad. But actually, like in the right hands, the tech is good. But I think before we, when we were talking about the technology itself, before even discussing who deployed it, um, 
we all like raised a lot of red flags or shook our heads. So um, I think that is something that should be considered is not just like, you know, is something that comes out from Facebook uh, good or bad because it's Facebook, but thinking about like, okay, what is the technology that they have deployed? Um, how will people engage with it? What are the uses of it? And really kind of like separating like the actor from the technology because, you know, the technology can be used. Um, like there can be a company that you like that puts out a technology um, that has unintended consequences. Yeah, and predictive models are really interesting because uh, if you think about in Civil War at the end, um, Iron Man is fighting Captain America, this epic battle, and Iron Man for a bit of time is just like letting Captain American America just hit him constantly because he's taking the data of how his hits are landing, what the pattern looks like in order to fight back and fight him more effectively. And maybe that's good. I would love to have that when I'm walking around at night, like honestly, but of course you see how it could be used in the wrong hands, like it could be bad. Totally. There's real world examples of that, the facial recognition, for example, where, hey, what guys are in the natural world, but if you're a metal white guy, they're going to flag you as a bad person. Yeah, 100%. And there's a lot of, again, algorithmic injustice panel is later today. If you want to <laughs> attend that, we'll be going more in depth on that for sure. Um, facial. Oh, sorry, I didn't. I forget that you all can't hear um, facial recognition and how just how problematic that can be, particularly as it relates to uh, discrimination against people of color, things of that nature. Um, and we saw facial recognition actually being used in the Spider-Man movie um, and misused pretty poorly. So you can see with the, I see you back there, Spider-Man. <laughs> um, the oh, I had a friend okay. one time that talked about how like data and algorithms can't be biased and he because he, he's a data analyst so he's very like black and white like science -y, like math and I'm I'm in policy world I love having philosophical discussions and talking about like things in the gray area and I he like made it as an offhand comment I think about it literally every day <laughs> of my life and I don't think he knows how much his comment uh, <laughs> triggered me. <laughs> I mean, look at my shirt. It says Rage Against the Machine Learning. <laughs> there is so much data about how we're going to get out by the algorithms. I don't know what people look at. Yeah, and I think it's more of a mainstream like talking point now and again like not to continue to hint at the later panel, but there's uh, some legislation that they'll be discussing because I think that's like a very key thing is trying to uh, regulate algorithms, have some transparency, and kind of combat some of the biases and harms. Yes? Uh, coming back to Project Insight, you have a microphone, everything's being recorded. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Alright, uh, so um, coming back to Project Insight, there's an episode of Star Trek Voyager where they actually prosecute people based on the thoughts they have in their minds. So if you have a bad thought, they're going to actually prosecute you. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> um, we're just going to stand farther away. Uh, so I think whether you like Voyager or not, or like Star Trek or not, that actually is a good episode for exploring the effectiveness of stopping crime. Because there was no crime-ish on that world, um, but it was a huge violation of human rights. And so I think it's a, a good way to look at technology. Like, technology is neutral, sure, but um, is it a violation of human rights? And I think that's where Project Insight really crosses the line. Like, sure, it was probably going to be super effective, probably too effective, but it's a pretty big violation of human rights. So I don't know what I was going with. The thing threw me off. No, I think that's a great point. And I think, like, we would probably, like, you know, like, um, if – us at Future of Privacy Forum had uh, a company that presented us with Project Insight as kind of like a briefing and was like, what do you think of that? 
Um, <laughs> I mean, it'd be tough to come up with specifics, but I think we'd probably recommend that, like, uh, generally we think that privacy should be baked into a project at the outset. We don't think that, like, you know, by the time Captain America got to see Project Insight, it was, like, fully baked about uh, days from launch, and he, like, kind of raised the, like, the privacy and really human rights issues with it. Uh, maybe they hadn't thought about it. Maybe they had and decided it didn't matter, but I think... Um, something that we recommend and something that we have been seeing increasingly is that privacy should be baked in from the beginning. You don't want to go back and have this product and then afterwards be like, oh, maybe we should, maybe we should do something about that to make uh, people's privacy be considered. <laughs> yeah, and it's really interesting in the U.S. because um, I referenced the GDPR earlier today, and a lot of what they have in there compares what technology companies do against what they have as a constitutional right to privacy. Um, that's not really a thing in the U.S., um, which is a reason that, you know, Roe versus Wade was struck down. And so it is kind of an issue in our country um, that we don't recognize it as a as a riot. Yeah, it's, it's not just uh, just the MCU. We've been exploring this concept uh, all over the genre from uh, the, the phone thing in Dark Knight uh, to person of interest, to minority report. Uh, I can't think of one example where we implemented some kind of, hey, let's try and solve crime ahead of time, and people said, this is going to work out great. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And totally. absolute power corrupts absolutely, so you got to find some way to pull that back. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing. If you solve crime before it happens, the, the Avengers are going to be out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> For the Avengers. <laughs> oh man! Do we have anything good. else? I think that's it on Project Insight. Did you want to talk about the the Edith glasses and facial recognition? Yeah. So everybody remembers the Edith glasses, right? Um, and how Tony gave it to Peter Parker to use. Um, he trusted him with it. So you know, you can think about it in the data context. I am giving this data specifically to you. <laughs> Please don't give it to other people. Um, and Peter Parker doesn't know how to use it very well, which is a lesson in trusting technology to people and organizations, because you see when he, they're on this bus, um, he accidentally orders a drone strike on a guy that he doesn't like. Um, and you see there are actually really real consequences to facial recognition, but of course, like these algorithmic systems generally, and the kind of outcomes that they can produce. And so um, there's that component, and then there's the co component we were talking about earlier today in terms of bias and discrimination, um, and how those particularly used in the wrong hands are really problematic in exacerbating existing inequalities. Yeah, I think a good point with the Edith class is that was um, maybe an illustrative example of like making sure you have appropriate safeguards and technology because you know when Tony Stark was using the Edith glasses like he knew himself he knew what he was going to do um, but when he was designing that product he didn't think of a teenager as the end user and didn't think about like okay how how could a teenager use this and we saw that like okay when a teenager uses these very powerful glasses they're going to be very uh, they're very hormonal, have a lot of like drama going on with, <laughs> uh, with people they might have a crush on and like how can the technology and I'm like Peter Parker is a good person like he didn't like intentionally like set off a drone strike but it was so easy to do and was just uh, triggered by his emotions and it was clear that when Tony Stark had created the Edith glasses he didn't ever anticipate a scenario where they could end up in not his own hands. Well, it's also just scary that, like, Tony Stark had a facial recognition system that could recognize anybody in the world. And, like, read everyone's text messages. <laughs> yeah, and... right, exactly. And then just, like, because this is how it, it kind of can work. Like, yeah. you can just give it to whoever you want. And, honestly, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but that was an issue with Clearview AI, which is a, a facial recognition company. They just kind of scrape any and all information that they can get from you um, from the publicly available web and then use that to kind of create a database and create the algorithm that goes along with it. So um, left unchecked, you know, they, yeah. which they currently are pretty much. Yeah, and Tony Stark created a lot of his products like in isolation. Like he wasn't like, he was, there was no, I don't think there was a process where he was like consulting people throughout and being <laughs> like, what do you think about this? What are the harms? Like how... Uh, 
something that like when companies talk to us about products, we'll say like, okay, have you thought about like how this could be weaponized against like um, stalkers or abusers or mm. like how can this be weaponized when like so I do work in like youth and uh, student privacy so like something we really think of is like how how would this product look in a home where someone is an LGBTQ student but their parent does not agree with that um, because a lot of the time in uh, youth privacy uh, when people uh, say they want protections for youth they usually mean like parent monitoring parent surveillance um, but sometimes the parent doesn't always have the child's best interest and a child needs space to kind of like have some privacy from their parent um, and I don't think Tony Stark was really doing too much critical thinking uh, in a lot of these products I think he was just <laughs> thinking like okay like I, I'm very smart <laughs> I'm very rich uh, what can I do with all of my smarts and money I know it's so cool though <laughs> <laughs> yeah didn't you say that he's your favorite <laughs> I do I think he's so cool like the technology he developed I think is cool and like a lot of these companies are trying to do it for good um, but, I mean, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be regulated. Um, a really relevant real-life example is I think the ring cameras on people's front door, their feed, like, goes directly to the local police station. And so, on a plus side, like, the police have been able to catch a lot of people that steal packages and stuff like that. But the police isn't always, like, the most trustworthy work organization. So, that's a... To a perfect example of what you guys are talking about where a lot of times the homeowners don't even know that you know it's just like a default setting that's turned on mm -hmm. that they share their um, footage with the police station yeah and that's actually uh so in the u.s we have what are called like state and sectoral laws so privacy can be regulated amongst different states and then by different categories of data so like financial data biometric data like i talked about before so ring is actually getting sued right now um because plaintiffs allege that they can identify passer buyers and so in illinois specifically you're supposed to get consent before you are collecting any kind of um biometric identifying information uh, so obviously with passer buyers i mean it also raises the question like how do you get consent for somebody who's passing by a house i don't know but also like yeah if you can identify somebody what are the ethics and limitations of that technology yeah a lot of i feel like tony stark's technologies are like like outward facing to where uh he can just see what everyone is up to all the time and those people uh, did not consent to that, uh, but their faces sure are uh, being <laughs> being recorded and used and put wherever Tony Stark has decided <laughs> to put them. Yeah. Um, anyone else have any questions? Um, I thought that there was talk of having ethicists and philosophers look at big technology whenever it's going to be developed, whether it's just computer programs, uh, DNA gathering, biotechnology, and things like that. Is there any progress in that end? Yeah, so a lot of research is being done in certain sectors. So NIST, which is the National Institute of Science and Technology, does a lot of trying to figure out ethical standards for what this technology's accuracy should be, how you should be developing it, things like that. Um, again, it's not like something that companies are required to adhere by, but it's like the gold standard. Um, and at FPF, actually, we what we try to do is like really put together technologists, academics, people who are like really thoughtful about this to develop these business practices for these organizations when they're developing the product. So specifically for consumer genetic testing companies, which are not regulated by HIPAA because they're private companies. Um, we tried to put together a framework of what you should be doing when you're collecting this data, how and when you should share it, if at all, things like that. Um, but again, there's no enforcement mechanism, so it's kind of up to the company whether they want to actually abide by that. Yeah, and even internally, that's something that we think about because, like, so me and Tatiana are both lawyers, um, but we, so we have that, like, very legal perspective and then uh, obviously policy perspective because we are at a think tank. Um, but we hire technologists, uh, we hire uh, people who have gotten their PhD because, you know, uh, I don't think me and Tatiana purport to have all the answers on privacy and how to think about it. And so uh, I work very closely with a technologist on my team who uh, was the like chief technologist for a really large school district in Virginia. So he did all of the app vetting for all of the tools um, that were used in classrooms. And I think his school district had like several thousand people. Actually, several thousand. I said that out loud. It's not that much. But <laughs> yeah, it's like the 10th largest school district in the country. That's all I know. Um, 
But yeah, so when we are internally trying to come up with what our recommendations are for companies or what our recommendations are for like in um, like health data tools, um, we make sure that it's not just like the lawyers in the room. We want to have the technologists that really understand the technology and have engaged with the technology because again, like I might have a great idea that sounds great in practice and then the person who has been working on the ground for decades is like, well, that doesn't make sense or it does make sense, but that's just nobody's going to follow whatever rule that you've just thought up. <laughs> uh, yes. Can you do you want yeah, to come, come up to, to the, the mic? mic? You're a little yeah. quiet. Sorry. <laughs> um, because privacy often ends up touching on topics that end up bumping into a lot of other values, it seems like eventually you're likely to bump into crowdsourced, non-corporate entities that are doing some of the things that uh, you might see as uh, problematic for privacy. You might see crowdsourced groups that are uh, n uh, local neighborhood watches uh, setting up uh, cameras that are going to identify when people walk around to catch uh, package thieves, for example. I, I live in New York City, and uh, I've had several thousand dollars worth of equipment stolen. Mm. And I, I, I often think about uh, how nice it would be to catch those people. Um, but but I recognize that there are privacy concerns. Do you think that uh, the tools that you imagine, the legal tools that you imagine would be useful to deal with privacy for a corporation, are they going to be sufficient or are they going to be different uh, when dealing with non-corporate entities, uh, crowdsourced groups that are not trying to make money, uh, that aren't even necessarily incorporated, but are still attempting to work on some of the particular topics where privacy is often uh, active as well? Yeah, great question. Um, and something that definitely comes up uh, quite a bit. In terms of policy and regulations, most of the regulations that have come out have a certain threshold for what uh, entities these apply to. So typically, it's not usually like nonprofits. Typically, it's not always small businesses. Um, but that also still raises the question of like those privacy harms still are there um, and they still can be significant. Um, but on the other hand, you don't want to perhaps be shutting down nonprofits or um, mom and pop shops. So it definitely is like a trade off in, in thinking about. Um, but right now, policy typically does try to differentiate those different kind of organizations. Yeah, and I think to that point, having having a law or having a regulation is not the only way to to protect privacy and to think about privacy. Um, there's plenty of ways to kind of like combat privacy harms that don't involve a law, um, because not every not every instance of like a privacy violation necessarily needs a law. Not every every instance of a privacy violation like a law will help. That's something that's like a very fraught issue in privacy is just like. Uh, like what is a privacy harm worth because you know you have those like class action lawsuits with a data breach and you get like like ten dollars like uh, that like punishes the company but did it help you um, so I think like the other like non regulation ways to think about privacy are just like you know like shaming your neighbors is one way for sure like <laughs> like if any of my neighbors had a ring camera and were like making comments to me about how they watch me I'd be like that's really weird like can you can you not or like I would tell them my thoughts on <laughs> a ring camera um, and then also like uh, with companies in particular you can just choose to choose to not participate in that company anymore like if the privacy harms um, are too great for you um, and then also like companies can be making advances in privacy uh, without like in absence of regulation like that's something we're seeing now because there there is no federal privacy law um, but I think that we have seen like in the last couple of years uh, companies have been definitely more privacy uh, minded as we have as a society decided that's something that's very important to us like it's always like privacy has been like a deeply ingrained thing in like American society but I think like particularly in a post Dobbs era everyone like it's very top of mind um, I think I saw a lot more like articles on like 
precise geolocation data and it was like a, a like a popular talking point like mainstream news and I was like oh that's like a pretty niche like privacy thing and now everyone is thinking about it um, and there's no like law telling companies what they have to do uh, with that data but now companies are voluntarily coming out and making statements about what they're going to do um, in response to, to public concerns. Yeah, which is actually why like it is good to be a concerned citizen <laughs> because companies like do actually like listen like in, if you really do believe in capitalism like they respond to the market theoretically. <laughs> like if you believe in capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean, if if their cons- if their um, user base is being like you have really crappy privacy policies or like I don't like how you're using my data I'm not going to use you anymore I'm going to use this other company it's the kind of um, classic industry against industry (laughs) uh, regulatory framework but um, it does matter um, particularly when we don't have these laws always regulating everything yeah and taking it back to the to the MCU I think I think of any of uh, Peter Parker's classmates knew that there was a drone strike that had almost taken place like there would have been some repercussions uh, in absence of, like, there was no regulation addressing that particular incident, but I think, like, he probably would have gotten in trouble with his chaperone, or even, not just that, like, his classmates would have been like, what is wrong with you? I think uh, Ned's his friend, but Ned would have been like, that wasn't cool, you can't just, like, uh, like, it, it was way too easy for that drone strike to have been deployed. Yeah, and way too easy to just, like, give it over to Mysterio as well. Just like, oh yes, I transfer these over here. <laughs> yeah, he was very, very easily persuaded. But <laughs> uh, cool. So we are about wrapped up. Does anyone have any last uh, questions for us? Awesome. Um, oh, what what should we do right now? Oh, great question. <laughs> <laughs> right now, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Hmm. Call your representatives. <laughs> yeah, I think call your representatives. Also, just just stay staying informed. I think is really key um, because uh, privacy really affects. Uh, at this point, it's converging with a lot of other like tech policy issues. Um, you may or may not know about like Section Two Hundred and Thirty and content moderation. That was like a big thing uh, in the Trump administration. Um, that was like a very like mainstream talking point that like before that had been like fairly like niche not a lot of people knew what section 230 was um and i think there's a lot of parts of privacy that people aren't thinking about and also like what you can do today is um a lot of people when i tell them i do privacy they don't like fully understand what it is i do and they think like oh like i don't have anything to hide um so i think having that mindset of like privacy isn't about hiding something it's about like your it's it's a human right i think is fair to say and so just having that mindset and how you approach your every day um is very key because there's a lot of people that like post Dobbs, everyone was very concerned about location uh tracking but that's something that's been going on for years and not something anyone that was thinking about and i had a lot of friends that suddenly were like asking me questions and very concerned and it was the same people that were like I don't have anything to hide. Like, I don't care. Like, uh, Facebook has all my data anyways. Um, but there, there are real harms that people are suffering. So even if like you yourself don't feel that your privacy is threatened, like thinking about marginalized communities, uh, and speaking on their behalf is helpful as well. And I'm sure there's a newsletter with EFF that you can sign up for and get more information on. (laughs) plug for y'all yeah yeah and in terms of takeaways from this panel i was trying to think of like a positive note to end on and talking about the technologies but i think really the the best thing we can say is just that like it's great that project insight uh is fiction yeah for now yeah (laughs) 